Yes, so I would like to welcome everybody for the Joint Minds and Ideas All Hands meeting in 2020. I would like to emphasize how important it is that minds and ideas joined hands in this meeting. So recognizing the fact that we are all working in the same direction. So our vision is that big data and AI go hand in hand and it's, there's an increasing importance on AI ready data. And so the recognizing the strong synergy between minds and ideas, we thought it was important that we actually try to bring our two communities closer and maximize the overlaps. So what we have found over the last year that there is an increased relevance of medical applications. So there is a dramatic growth of big data in medical imaging, petascale brain science, large scale genomics, epidemiology. We also see that large scale microscopy means big data. There are several large microscopy projects at JHU and which are in, on the verge of generating petabytes of data. We have been leading the worldwide effort in defining numerical laboratories. How do we do interactive science with first principle numerical simulations, starting from turbulence to astrophysics and in many other areas of science, and how we have in basically invented new metaphors for interacting with the data how users don't even know whether it's you know a few gigabytes of data in the back or it's petabytes they can interact with the same ease with the data and do virtual experiments what we also see is that researchers who are very eager to actually start working in ai and machine learning on their own data sets they need support and hand holding so we would like to our vision is that we will serve as also kind of a clearinghouse for such projects and we can provide actual tangible help in all the aspects of what this takes. So part of this is the size server that we have been working on now for quite a long, long time. Size server is a data aggregator for big data and which also provides simultaneous computing and collaborative features. You will see a uh, breakout session on how to use the size server and we would like to encourage to try this we also are in the business of providing scalable compute computational resources which includes marcy which includes the size server which includes the data scope we also have lots of gpu capabilities and but when we look 10 years ahead we actually need to figure out a scalable approach so how we can't afford to buy all the computers that we would need maximally. We have to come up with a supportable and sustainable solution, which means that every once in a while, we will have to overflow to the cloud when we have large scale computing, so transient large scale computing jobs. And we need to actually start engaging with the cloud providers now. And we are in the process of doing that. So how can we create an elastic environment? And another interesting feature of, of AI combined with big data is how future large scale experiments will be designed by AI. So that out of the infinitely many possibilities, how can we decide using an objective cost function that which of the small number of experiments should be chosen that we can actually do given our budgets. So the current research efforts are so basically, a lot of the efforts that we have been doing has enabled JHU to tap into big national goals, partly the NS, NSF 10 big ideas, the JHU strategic initiatives, and also the NIH big data to knowledge. And we have supported an extensive infrastructure. So there is Marcy, the time we will talk about, there is the site server, there's the data scope, which is basically a large data supercomputer optimized for very high IO bandwidths. And we are also the lead institution in an NSF funded project called the Open Storage Network, where we are setting up small data hubs at research universities outside the university firewalls, which are connected with 100 gig networks and can enable the fast transfer of petabyte scale data sets. So the big data enabled us leadership 
sometimes I like to call this an unfair advantage in multiple areas. So unfair advantage means that we actually have some data sets which enable us to do unique science and unique machine learning and AI projects. And these are there in material science. One good example is, for example, how Paradigm, a large scale NSF funded project between Hopkins and Cornell has been able to actually get up and running in a matter of weeks on the SI server. We have the turbulence databases. I will show some numbers about this shortly. We are getting into large scale oceanographic simulations. And of course, a lot of our efforts and ideas started with the sky surveys, with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is now continuing with the Subaru PFS. And there is now an increased engagement in personalized health, cancer immunotherapy, and genomics. So this is just a very quick sample, you know, a, a coffee book atlas of some of our big data projects. So I don't want to go into the details here. But I would like to say just a few words about the Sci Server. So Sci Server was grew out of the Sky Server, which was a database for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, where we created a 20-year project that is mapping the whole North and Sky to utmost detail with the intention of making the data immediately available. And in the process, this was one of the big first big science project that made its data entirely open and public. And we learned a lot in the process, in particular, how people want to collaborate. And we are trying to simplify bringing disparate data sets together under the same hood so that we can do a joint analysis. And we have petabytes of service-oriented data of, on, the, on the site server. It's a collaborative framework with lots of shared resources. And the system captures extremely well the interactivity of science and engineering that we don't want to write workflows. We want to roll up our sleeves and actually do, exper do experiments with the data. And once we figure out that what works really well, then we want to scale it up to analyze the whole big data set. And we have, uh, we balance the kind of safety and security of the core data and we also need actually an open framework where people can try out ideas and play it and do anything and everything. And we managed to do this by giving the users their own databases, which are on the periphery. They are still server side, but basically located on the surface of the core data sets. And it's very easy to bring in some new large data sets. Currently, we have more than three and a half petabytes of live data. And it does provide a competitive advantage to Hopkins-based projects. We have various integrated components. We can do very large-scale relational database queries. We can do Python, MATLAB, and R scripting on top of this, all shared. We have most of the major AI frameworks integrated, so TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch. And we also have advanced GPU tools. So these are all the current projects on the SI server and ideas today. You can see that there is a big diversity in diff over different disciplines. And we have an increased involvement with the School of Medicine. So for example, in cancer immunotherapy, we have taken the lessons learned in sky surveys and applied it to medical imaging. And we are now, we have a pipeline of six automated microscopes, trillions of pixels, billions of cells, and we are heading towards petabytes of data. And we have collaborations with Bristol Myers Squibb, with Acquia Biosciences, we got private funding from the Mark Foundation, from the Amazon Collaborative, the Melanoma Research Alliance, and NIH. We also are working on a big prostate cancer U01 project. In personalized medicine, those of you who have used the system, the Cruncher engine is essentially a modified SI server that can operate in a HIPAA compliant safe environment. And now the School of Medicine is hiring a person embedded in the SI server group. We developed a large DNA and RNA sequencing support. So we wrote a GPU tool, which is much faster than anything out there. And this is now running at several supercomputing centers in the US used by the wider community. 
And recently, Thomas Hartung submitted a Sloan proposal, a proposal to the Sloan Foundation on building mini brains, organoids with hundreds of electrodes and exploring hybrid biocomputing. And this is all in collaboration with the School of Medicine, Engineering, Biostats and, and uh, Physics and Astronomy. So in science and engineering, our, our main, one of our main resources is the turbulence database. This is now hosting the world's largest simulations of turbulence. It's becoming the virtual observatory of turbulence. And you can see as of last night, we have delivered 110, 101 trillion points to the world. So people don't have to run their own simulations. They can just do their statistics and machine learning on the data set provided by us. With the Poseidon project that's led by Tom Hain and Hopkins, we are building the world's largest ocean circulation model with MIT and Columbia, and we are turning it into an open interactive resource. We have a large involvement in material science we are supporting various large-scale microscopy engagements, including the cryo-EM. We have a 100 terabyte database of unique computational genomics data. This is in collaboration with Ben Langmitt and Jeff Leake and Kasper. And we have streaming algorithms on, for big data clustering where we can actually find clusters in, in a matter of minutes in billions of data points. And of course, we have not given up our astronomy routes. So the, the new astronomy project Sloan is continuing and we got a big grant from Eric Schmidt using AI and machine learning to design sky survey experiments. So what targets to choose on the Subaru PFS project. And we see great new opportunities in quantitative social science. We have intense discussion with Agora, with Baltimore City. And we also started a project with SAIS that is funded by the Sloan Foundation on the US energy infrastructure. This is again in collaboration with the engineering school. And we had an involvement with COVID. We were supporting the genomics effect, gen genomics project with Winston Tip and Stuart Ray. And we have a growing external engagement with the Kennedy Krieger Institute, Lieber, with Max Planck, the National Institutes of Health and Technology, the Bristol Myers Squibb and Akoya, and with NASA, and with the different supercomputer centers. So summarizing our research efforts, looking ahead is to support large scale instrumentation efforts and their data needs at Hopkins. We support sustainable data set development, the numerical laboratories. AI demands high quality AI ready scientific data sets. One of our core focus will be Baltimore City and quantitative social sciences, supporting large scale medical applications, explorations of the cutting edge and the synergies with minds. And I would like to finish in remembering Mark Robbins, our colleague who was an associate director of ideas who passed away this year. And Mark was the driving force behind our high performance computing effort. And he really had both a delicate and technical knowledge. And, and also he, was, he didn't take no for an answer. So without him, we would be much farther behind in, uh, in high performance computing. So Mark will be greatly missed. And in his memory, we are working on establishing a Mark Robbins Fellowship and we are sorting through the logistic, but will be announced before the end of the year. And with this, I would like to hand over to Rene. Then thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. I hope you can see my screen, Alex. Yeah. Let me uh, begin by saying good morning and welcome to everybody. Um, I would like to begin by echoing uh, Alex's uh, remarks. Uh, I think it's really wonderful that uh, uh, ideas and minds have uh, uh, been able to organize this event uh, together. I think ideas and minds share a vision of the importance of data science across science and engineering. And I think uh, we have uh, a slightly different focuses, but I think we complement greatly and uh, we are very much looking forward to uh, multiple joint activities uh, moving forward. 
Uh, in this part, uh, what I wanted to do was to uh, uh, give a little bit of a welcome, a, a little bit of a summary of the activities in mind and, and focus a little bit on the awards uh, that uh, faculty and students have received throughout the year. So uh, as a matter of introduction, uh, MINDS is a relatively new institute at Johns Hopkins, was created just three years ago. Uh, it has over 30 faculty from uh, applied math and statistics, biomedical engineering, computer science, electrical and computer engineering, as well as more broadly from math, medicine, and biostatistics. Uh, we have one National Academy member and four Bloomberg Distinguished Professors. MINDS, uh, it's a new institute, but it's growing. We received uh, six faculty positions and uh, we will be hiring again this year. So uh, if there are any young stars that would like to apply, we are looking forward to receiving their applications. Uh, the mission of the institute uh, is to focus on data science, but in particular on the mathematical, statistical, and computational foundations uh, behind the analysis of very large and uh, complex data sets. In particular, uh, faculty have many uh, recent areas, research areas, but uh, to give a few examples of some of the areas, you can see them here from the theory of deep learning to people focused on graph theory, uh, convex optimization, high dimensional statistics, streaming, robust learning and controls. In addition to the research, uh, MINDS has also uh, been working very closely with uh, applied math and statistics and computer science to establish educational programs, uh, working uh, closely on creating new curricula for a, a master's program and the master's program already opened uh, and the first cohort was admitted in 2012. Moving forward, uh, we are planning to work on a minor, uh, on a PhD program and finally on a major. Um, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to welcome uh, the new faculty that we've recently hired uh, through uh, MINDS. First, our first hired is uh, Professor Soledad Villar. She is a assistant professor in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Statistics. She just started uh, a few months ago, uh, and uh, she's actually one of the organizers of this uh, symposium on behalf of MINDS. So let me uh, immediately say thank you to Soledad for the great effort that she's put together uh, in doing on, uh, organizing this symposium. Uh, the second uh, faculty who recruited uh, is Professor Rama Chalapa, uh, who uh, was recruited as a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor in Biomedical Engineering, as well as Electrical and Computer Engineering. He just joined us uh, this summer, and we are really uh, delighted to have him and be working uh, with him. He is uh, really a world leader in computer vision and pattern recognition. Uh, and last, uh, our most recent hire uh, this year, Professor Mahar Fas Fasliab. He uh, will be an assistant professor of electrical and computer engineering. He will join us uh, in that position starting next July. Uh, his area of research is in uh, robust learning and control. So uh, we are really excited uh, to see the growth of uh, MINDS with new faculty hires. And as I said, uh, we'll be recruiting more faculty this coming year. Uh, also, it's been really a great year at MINDS. Uh, many faculty have received uh, many awards. Uh, let me begin by highlighting our young stars, Professor Raman Arora and Ilya Spitzer. They both receive NSF career awards. Uh, many faculty uh, uh, have received fellowships in their respective fields, so we really have uh, an absolutely outstanding set of faculty. Uh, but let me also highlight our most senior faculty, Rama Chilapa, who received a uh, very important award from the IEEE in the area of signal processing. Um, but obviously, the, the, the most important award of the year, and I'd like to highlight him, is Professor Yanis Kebrekidis, who was elected to the National Academy of Engineering. Um, uh, there was also a great success at uh, the MINDS uh, during this year. Uh, in particular, uh, MINDS faculty uh, led a large team of 16 faculty from uh, both the US and Europe. 
on the mathematical foundations of deep learning. And this project, uh, the kickoff was just yesterday, so it's, it's getting started as we speak. And so uh, there will be a number of activities and engagement for all of our students and, and faculty, uh, uh, many symposia, workshops in uh, summer schools uh, that will focus on the mathematical foundations of deep learning. So stay tuned for future announcements to come in the next five years. Uh, similarly, uh, last year, uh, we had this uh, award from the National Science Foundation to develop uh, an institute, and this has been uh, sort of funding uh, part of MINDS. Uh, this is, uh, I think, connects very well with the synergy with uh, ideas here in that uh, one side of data science is really um, the machine learning side, which is sort of data driven. Another side is really the mechanistic models that are domain specific. And uh, the, this award in particular, it's looking at how do we integrate uh, more of classical, physical or mechanistic models with more uh, data-driven models. And uh, in particular, the grant is focusing on the integration of uh, deep learning and graphical models. So that's why it's a grant on the foundations of deep learning and graph learning. On top of that, uh, this program has a variety of educational and training activities for students that I'm gonna be mentioning uh, in a few moments, uh, but it includes a variety of symposia, summer schools, and so on and so forth, but I'll mention them next. Uh, in particular, uh, one of the highlights of uh, last year was a great symposium that we organized more or less uh, at the same time as it's happening right now. And we had a great set of speakers. Uh, and uh, we invited Professor Charles Menevo from Ideas uh, to join us, but there were many faculty from Minds Ideas, as well as uh, many external, great external speakers. Uh, this happened last fall. Uh, this winter, we had a, a great stars in, um, that came to visit us and uh, they presented their work uh, at the front line of the foundations of data science. So that was our second symposium. Uh, we have a regular uh, seminar series. Uh, we have partnered here with the Center for Imaging Science, and we have a joint seminar series that includes uh, not only the foundations of data science, but also uh, applications in the area of imaging. Uh, we've also created uh, a, a fellowship for students uh, that supports them for either uh, one semester or the summer. Uh, we uh, had selected eight fellows uh, for the 2019 and 2010 uh, group, and they're really doing a fantastic uh, job. They've been publishing a lot in various areas of uh, graph and deep learning. And uh, we are going to have a call for uh, data science fellows that's going to come up uh, in a month or so. And the idea is that the next uh, cohort of fellows uh, will be supported for the entire summer uh, in a sort of internship style, but they, they will be conducting research with uh, two faculty, uh, ideally with complementary expertise in the foundations of deep learning and graph learning. Um, the next uh, thing I wanted to mention is that we created uh, an award for our PhD students once they graduate. Uh, the award is based on uh, their quality of their dissertation. Uh, it, there is a nomination and a committee that selects the award winners. And uh, we will have a presentation this afternoon at 4.30 by the winner uh, of this year, 2012. Uh, last year, uh, we awarded uh, two of such awards, uh, one for 2018 and one for 2019, uh, to Professor Ling Yang, for, uh, who is a faculty at UCLA, and he uh, was uh, co-advised, I think, by Alex Alley and Vladimir Braverman in uh, physics and computer science, and uh, Dr. Chong Yu, who is now a postdoctoral researcher at UC Berkeley. So for uh, this year, uh, and you will see the, the presentation uh, this afternoon, uh, the winner is Dr. Chen Yi Liu, uh, who is uh, advised by Professor Alan Yule, who is a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor in Computer Science and Cognitive Science. And the title of his thesis is on the automation and diagnosis of visual intelligence. 
And uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, congratulate him. Uh, and we very much looking forward to uh, his presentation this afternoon. And the chair of the committee, Jeremiah Sulam, will be uh, explaining why uh, his thesis is, is really a wonderful contribution to data science. And uh, he will be giving a presentation about it. So let me just uh, congratulate uh, Cheng Yi Liu. In usual circumstances, we would have had uh, the Dean of the School of Engineering and his advisor uh, shake hands and congratulate him. Uh, but in, uh, instead of that, let me just uh, present to him uh, the uh, certificate. So with that in mind, uh, let me just uh, thank our uh, sponsors, uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, Whiting School of Engineering, as well as the National Science Foundation that is sort of supporting all of the activities and the, and the actually the awards uh, that uh, for these uh, doctoral students. So, well, thank you for your attention. And uh, I just wanted to say that I'm really excited about uh, the workshop today and I'll now begin uh, with the next session and introducing uh, our next speaker. So uh, let me begin simply uh, by saying that Alex and I uh, are on behalf of Ideas and Minds, are really excited to um, introduce uh, a great set of speakers uh, that will be presenting the latest and greatest in data science. So uh, to combine uh, the, the strength of minds and ideas, about half of our speakers really will be speaking about uh, the foundations of data science. Uh, and the other half of our speakers will focus on um, the data intensive uh, engineering and science. So uh, our first speaker is uh, Professor Lauren Gardner. She is an associate professor in the Department of Civil and Systems Engineering at Johns Hopkins Wyden School of Engineering. And she's also the co-director of the Center for System Science and Engineering. She's also an affiliated faculty in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Prior to joining Hopkins in 2019, uh, she was a senior lecturer and in civil engineering at the University of South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Her research expertise is in integrated transport and epidemiological modeling. In particular, her research utilizes network optimization and mathematical modeling to progress the state of the art in global epidemiological risk assessment. Beyond mobility, her work focuses more holistically on virus diffusion as a function of climate, land use, mobility, and other contributing risk factors. Lauren is the creator of the interactive web-based dashboard being used by public health authorities, researchers, and the general public around the globe to track the outbreak of the novel coronavirus that has spread worldwide since early January this year. The dashboard, which debuted on January 22nd of this year, has been shared by practically every major news outlet worldwide and now receives more than a billion usage requests per day. Because of her expertise, uh, Lauren was one of six Johns Hopkins experts who briefed congressional staff about the outbreak in Capitol Hill in early March this year. On September 22nd, Lauren was named uh, one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. So uh, with that introduction, let me just say that we are absolutely thrilled and delighted to welcome uh, Lauren Gardner as our plenary speaker for the uh, Minds Ideas Symposium in 2020. Welcome, Lauren. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, can, can everyone hear me fine? And I'm gonna go ahead and just sure. share my screen. Um, See. And uh, while you're sharing, uh, I'd like to encourage the audience to uh, uh, share questions either in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll be happy to take the questions at the end. Great. 
All right, thank you very much, Renee. That was yeah, a wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm really happy to be here um, and excited to talk to everybody. Um, so I, as mentioned, um, and maybe some of you are aware, uh, the, for the better part of this year, I've been spending my time uh, managing the Hopkins COVID-19 tracker uh, process. Let's see if I can. There we go. Um, sorry, a little bit of technical difficulties. There we go. Uh, so I am a professor in civil and systems engineering at Hopkins, and I'm I co-direct the Center for System Science and Engineering in the department as well. And so I've been leading this effort for trying to track this novel coronavirus as it's evolved from a few hundred cases in China to a full-blown global pandemic, as we all know. And so today I'm going to talk through a bit about this process and the evolution of the dashboard specifically that we've built here at Hopkins and talk about some of the challenges that we've faced along the way and some of the lessons that we've learned from that um, and provide a little bit of suggestions for how I think we might wanna move forward after this is done. So just a really quick intro for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with this, just to give a sense of, of what it is that we're, we're speaking about. Uh, so this is a, the dashboard that we built and the main objective behind it is to track COVID-19 cases, deaths, and recoveries for all countries reporting these cases around the world. And at the moment, this is about 200 countries, and we track this data, each of these three variables, for about 3,500 total locations um, because there's varying spatial scales. So for example, in the US, we track this data at the county level. Uh, for multiple countries, we track it at subnational levels. And then for some countries, we're still tracking it just nationally. And we're pulling data for all these locations for each of these three variables. So it's over 10,000 variables um, on an hourly basis. And this becomes an open data product that's fed up into the dashboard and into some, um, and into a GitHub, which I'll talk about in a minute. So, we have all of these data sitting live in the dashboard, as well as a time series that we track the temporal scale as well for both new cases and new deaths on a regular basis. Uh, so you can kind of explore peeing around on here. There's a text box with, um, like I say, lots of important stuff that nobody ever reads that I highly recommend people reference for um, some of the relevant links and, and background. And then one of the things that I just, I also want to note is that while we do have the kind of the famous picture of the map is the one with all the big red dots, which are tracking cumulative number of cases to date. Uh, I, there are some other layers of the map that are available on the dashboard as well, which personally I think are actually more informative and tell a more useful story of what's going on. And these are, these are data where we normalize the case and death values, for instance. So, um, on one hand, in the top left, we have one map with active COVID cases. And so these are total cases to date minus recoveries, minus deaths, which is intended to represent kind of more of a real-time snapshot of the risk of COVID at any point in time on any given day. Um, we also have case data normalized by population. So this is the case incidence rate um, because I think it's really important to put these total raw case numbers in perspective. And it's really unfair to compare 100 new cases of COVID in a country like India with 100 new cases of COVID in some small island nation. And then on the bottom left, we have the case fatality ratio map, which again normalizes deaths by cases. And I think this is another one that's really important um, for a couple different reasons. One, we can see for all of these, these huge variations in terms of the relative scale and risk of the outbreak in terms of cases and deaths. The case fatality ratio map indicates that the, the reported case fatality actually varies between well under 1% to over 25%, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I don't think this means that COVID really has that much of a variable 
case fatality rate. I think this points to a lot of different important factors that are going on right now, which have to do with what how data is being reported, um, both in terms of accuracy of case reporting, accuracy of deaths, but also what's available in terms of health infrastructure um, and surveillance resources in countries. And then we also, um, in addition to case data, case and death data, we have some US testing data, which we get directly from COVID tracking project that's focused on just the US states. Um, and this again is also normalized by population to try and keep tabs on how the testing has evolved over time. So that's just, that's the dashboard um, if you, you haven't seen it before. Um, and so I really wanna talk about why we did this and the genesis of it and how it's evolved over time. And so, as Renee mentioned, with the exception of 2020, I am actually much more of a data user rather than a data collector. So my expertise, my interest is really in using data to build mathematical models to understand infectious disease transmission risk and spread and potential harm posed and, and what are the contributing factors to these kinds of problems and among other research questions. And so, and I am particularly interested and focused on emerging infectious diseases. And these are, you know, novel pathogens where there's lots of uncertainty and we don't know what's going to happen. And they first show up somewhere in the world and then we want to understand what the risk is. And so in, this is a really data poor field. And so I'm really kind of acutely aware of this gap for information that's needed to understand these risks in real time. And so that interest coupled with the fact that I recently actually only got to Hopkins in, in 2019 and my first recruited PhD student, who's also a first year PhD student, um, is both Chinese and was personally interested in this outbreak as it was evolving locally in China. And then at the same time is very skilled in GIS um, and spatial modeling. And so during just one of our regular research meetings in January, we're talking about lots of other projects and, and COVID comes up and, you know, he's identified a few specific Chinese websites that are doing a good job tracking the outbreak as it's evolving. And we were talking about kind of the need for that data and how we can use it to understand its risk. Um, and so we decided that day uh, to start building out this data collection moving forward, making it public, and then also build alongside it a map to visualize the data as we were collecting it. And so we actually built the first prototype of the dashboard that evening. And, and I shared it on Twitter the next day alongside a link to the downloadable data, which we thought we would just continue to update on a daily basis. So this was when there was just a few hundred cases in, in China. Um, and it was a pretty manageable task. And so at the same time in parallel, we actually were providing this data and using it ourselves in the group to understand what the risk of COVID looked like and how it was evolving. And so this is just a little example on the left with some maps that we produced that were using global um, kind of meta population simulation modeling to understand spreading risk and infer things like how many cases actually we thought actually existed in China at the time versus how many were being reported and, and some of these kind of questions. So we were already really concerned and, and invested in understanding this um, as early as January. So the, the initial kind of structure and architecture behind this dashboard was really simple. There was a small handful of, of sources of web sources where we could even get this data and then, so we were manually curating data from some of these Chinese websites, also the Chinese CDC. And then also because we had put it out there, we were started off the first day using Google Sheets and opened it up for comments so people could give feedback. And we were basically getting crowdsourced information through direct communications that were allowing us to kind of go and be made aware of new cases and go and validate them and then manually curating this and pushing it regularly. It was once a day, then twice a day, then three times a day into Google Sheets and, and onto the dashboard as well. Um, so this worked at first, but it clearly didn't scale as we all know what happened with this outbreak. Um, something that's been really important to me from the start was the open nature of this whole effort. That was really the reason that we did it. And so 
to date, all of the data, all the numbers that go into that dashboard are made publicly available to anyone that wants access to them. And so they're all stored on our, um, our GitHub repository, along with lots of documentation about what are all the data sources that we're using for the data on the dashboard, as well as a really long list of data modifications that we've made and errata over time, as well as when um, retrospective reporting changes happened and we go and make updates um, retrospectively as well. So everything is documented, every number that goes in and every number that's changed. And then the feature layers are also made available um, open through ArcGIS online. And then one thing I just want to note that was, it was a bit of a challenge for us was the appropriate terms of use for this. So from the beginning, like I said, we wanted it to be open and it was open for all public health, research, academic uses. Um, so anything that we felt was appropriate uses of the data at the time to do good. But it was initially restricted from commercial use. Um, and we've since relaxed that. So now we're uh, everything is open under a Creative Commons attribution license. Um, and this is because there was just continually a lot of use cases that came to us um, that I felt were, were really appropriate useful um, applications of this data. And so, and then there was just issues of, of fairness in terms of who was able to actually access us and get these one-off approvals and it was becoming really demanding as well. So, so we actually, so for multiple reasons, but those being some, we, we opened this license up to everyone. Um, and another thing that we did really early, and this was actually published in February, was uh, a short letter in the Lancet Infectious Diseases just documenting the protocol behind the dashboard, the basic data collection as it was at the time, as well as a validation of our data against other authoritative data sources like the Chinese CDC and the WHO to show that our data tracked against their data exactly. But the difference was that any specific snapshot in time, we were always reporting more cases and more locations than someone like the WHO. And this is really highlighted on this timeline on, on the bottom right. Uh, and so what this shows is on the bottom are all the WHO situation reports and each report on each day, the list of countries that were newly included in that report. On the top is when we introduced those countries into the dashboard. And they're blue if we introduced them before the WHO situation report was published and they're red if we missed it. And so with a couple exceptions, which were really early on when everything was still manual and I'm pretty sure they were on Saturday mornings when Frank was asleep, um, we pretty much always got countries updated on the dashboard and included before they were out before they were published formally by WHO or, or any other authoritative re reporting system. And so I think this to me really speaks to the value of this dashboard in the earliest stages of the outbreak when we were able to alert people and the public and everyone really to what was going on and how this was evolving in real time. So I guess for, for these kind of reasons, uh, the dashboard took off beyond anything we could have expected in just a matter of days. So we, I posted it on Twitter, like I said, initially thinking this would be something valuable for, you know, my small research community of infectious disease modelers, and maybe they would get some use out of it. Um, and it got, went from thousands of hits to over 10 million hits within just one week from when we published it. So this was being picked up by US and international press. It was being used already to kind of inform and guide policy all over the world. And, and this was happening, this growth in terms of the usership and demand on the actual dashboard was happening also because the outbreak itself was starting to be reported um, both exponentially in terms of number of cases, but also in more and more locations. So this kind of two-sided exponential growth in terms of both the scale of the outbreak and the scale of the demand on us for users forced us to re-strategize our approach, our very simple manual approach. So just by the beginning of February, we partnered up with Esri, who was providing the GIS software that we were using that the dashboard was built in. Um, 
as well as other group, other teams at Hopkins. So specifically the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab who helped at, contribute to building out a much more robust and resilient data pipeline for curating and collecting all this data and providing these open data products. Um, and then the Sheridan libraries as well, so that we, who helps support us with internal um, hosting services for all of the new data curation that we were doing on the, on the university side. And this is actually, this whole thing was really initially funded through my startup, because like I said, I got here in, in 2019, um, and that was insufficient for this effort. So uh, luckily the university very quickly jumped on board and was really supportive and has been ever since, um, and, is, and is still continued. And we can see that as evidence also in terms of all the uses of this dashboard and, and the evolution of the Coronavirus Resource Center itself. So with this new partnership, we started building out a more extensive architecture to support this data collection effort. So this is kind of stage two. We'll have another stage in a little bit. The, the immediate focus for us was automation. So we had no choice as the data, as the outbreak was evolving and now there was more and more locations that we were needing to collect data from. We had to both in parallel be able to identify and validate um, new reliable sources and also at the same time automate the data collection from these sources. And so this was a really tough process because we started this dashboard when there wasn't any formal web pages by public health authorities or agencies that designed or hosted to just report COVID data. Now there are and it's great, but at the time there wasn't. So we were really having to like find these as they were coming about and and combine them with other kind of less traditional data sources. You know, there was a lot of updates on things like Twitter by PAHO regional offices around the world when there was a new case of these kind of one-off posts and things that were allowing us to validate cases. But um, so we started expanding our data set, our data sources and automating them as well, and then pulling them into and collecting that. And then the main focus was getting this more automated process, which started happening on a regular basis. So we started doing this as kind of an hourly web scraping and, and pushing this data into GitHub rather than Google Sheets because we outgrew Google Sheets really quickly um, and pushing this data into GitHub where it was taken immediately from GitHub for lots of applications like a lot of the news media sources, CNN, NPR, any public consumers that wanted access to it. Um, any research groups, as well as pushed to various GIS and web services. So this included the push to our dashboard, which is the side that Esri managed. Um, so they would pull the data from our GitHub that we provided and push it into the dashboard. And then also to many other emergency response centers that were accessing the data directly themselves and pulling it into their own, um, their own dashboards. So this helped, but obviously this is just kind of one stage in this process. At the same time that we were doing this, the outbreak was still growing exponentially. So again, this started in February and we, we all know what's happened since. Um, and so the outbreak was evolving. So we were just kind of frantically trying to keep up with new data as it was coming available. At the same time, the dashboard usage was also growing exponentially from I said thousands to millions to billions of requests a day. Um, it was being trending on GitHub. So at some point, you know, I think around April, we were getting over 4 billion requests on the dashboard a day. Um, I, I don't know what it is to date. Back in August, I mean, there was over 180 billion requests total. Um, now I'm sure it's over 200 billion. It's a lot. It's numbers that don't even mean anything to me because they're too big. Um, and then this Usership was generated by everyone, which is great. Um, it was had pretty much circulated and gone viral on all the social media platforms and then was being used all the way up to kind of the highest levels of government in the US and also internationally. Uh, and so I, I love this photo of our dashboard photo bombing our Vice President Mike Pence at the HHS Operations Center. Um, and so while this data was being used and we were really excited about that, it posed a lot of new challenges and some unexpected challenges for me. So on one hand, because of the evolution of the outbreak, 
and how many new places were getting infected and affected. There was obviously lots of concern and lots of people very invested in understanding this data and also helping us improve it. So if we didn't have new data up on that dashboard for certain parts of the world, sometimes within an hour of when it was reported on some you know, Twitter account, then we were made aware of it by members of the public or sometimes also even through the media. And so we were trying to keep up with that. And then at the same time dealing with challenges like how do we deal with um, disputed territorial boundaries when you might have two regions in the world that are both reporting case, case data on the same location. So we wanted to make sure we weren't double counting and how do we allocate these cases. Um, the naming convention was a problem early on. I had one day in particular where I actually personally received about 2,000 emails from concerned citizens of a particular country that were very unhappy with the naming convention that we had chosen, um, and understandably so. And so we had to kind of deal with some of these geopolitical issues. Um, and then we had issues all the way up to, you know, our own administration falsely accusing us of putting this data behind a paywall when it was actually just temporarily down due to some technical difficulties for a few hours one day. And so we're trying to kind of keep up with this ever-changing landscape of data and the outbreak while also dealing with these times, types of communications publicly. Um, so it was, it was a real challenge. These things together have kind of forced us really um, into a much more robust architecture to support this effort. So what started as just a few um, kind of less traditional sources has evolved into a more automated, automated data collection effort across now over 400 different data sources. This is everything from city and county level um, public health websites and state public health authorities up to country ministry of health um, and, and various other groups. So any authoritative source that provides their data publicly um, we're including. And then we also still are having to supplement this with some crowdsourced websites um, as well, because not all the data is in, you know, machine readable formats that are accessible to us, unfortunately. So we have massively expanded this, this data collection and data sourcing set, and then uh, improved the actual architecture as well, with two critical components that we built from scratch custom for this effort. Um, one of them is a fusion logic that we had to do because of inconsistencies between data that was coming from overlapping jurisdictions. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And another major one is an anomaly detection and error correction system. So this is because, like I said, we're pulling you know, over 10,000 variables on an hourly basis from hundreds of different sources. And we needed some way to try and identify and detect any potential errors before we push them public. This is a continually evolving logic that we've built and are continually refining it as well. So it's not perfect, but it does help us catch a lot of issues. And these are issues based on errors that might come into play because of just manual ent data entry errors upstream, or because data structures are changed that we're reading in, which might made make us read in a variable incorrectly. And then we also built out a parallel testing pipeline so that all changes we make to this infrastructure, we can test in the background before we um, push anything into production. So again, we're just trying to make this more robust and more resilient. Um, and it still definitely always involves a very manual effort for validation of the anomalies that we detect, for instance. So when we have numbers that come through that are not within our kind of predefined threshold that we are willing to accept and just automate, then these are flagged and, and held back until we can manually validate them. And so all of this is done before the data goes in as an open data product into the GitHub and also into the dashboard and then into wherever else it, it ends up living. So we have this now much more robust automated process. It scales a lot better, but it is much more complex. So in terms of how the dashboard data is used today, um, so it's all the same uses that I had mentioned before. 
Um, in general, I think it's it's really serving a lot of public good, which which is great. Um, it's clearly used and relied upon heavily in the mainstream media, so we can probably all see it on CNN all the time. Um, it's really important to me. It's just accessible and used by individuals and the general public to help with just their own decision making on a daily basis. And that's because this data, the same data set is accessible to anyone, whether you're a policymaker or you just want to know what's happening in your neighborhood. And, and there's um, some evidence of this is it's been integrated into Google Maps, for instance. And so people can see when they move around um, what the COVID status is of the destinations that they're moving to. It's used to inform policy. So it's actually the, the baseline data for the CDC COVID-19 forecasting efforts. So all of the data, this is kind of used as the validation data set. It's also used as the training data set for most of the, most of the groups that are contributing models to this forecasting. Um, and my group is actually one of these. So we use the data ourselves internally to build out prediction models for COVID um, spread and new cases and new deaths and things like that and submit them to the CDC forecasting effort as well. So I'm very acutely aware of the challenges in using this data and also some of the, um, some of the potential messiness of it. And so we can see evidence of these uses on the academic side um, through the Lancet paper that I cited at the very beginning, which this is a little bit out of date, but it's you know only been out for seven or eight months and I think it has over 2000 citations already. And then internally at Hopkins, this data has been um, initially kind of served as the fundamental basis for the Coronavirus Resource Center. And so that started off by pulling in the world map that we had and then also adding a new US map that's a bit of a deep dive into um, COVID-19 risk in the US. It pulls all of our US case death and recovery data. And then it, it overlaps that with other really relevant contextual variables like employment status and health infrastructure and race um, and other demographic variables to get a better understanding of, of COVID risk in the US. And that effort has really expanded to date as well um, and includes the Bloomberg School of Public Health as well as the Center for Civic Impact um, to not only have you know, all of the case data and the tracking and the analysis behind that, but also lots of um, other trackers and data collection efforts behind testing and contact tracing um, as well. So I think it's probably evident why this is a challenge, but if it's not evident, um, I will highlight a few specific things that have really made this hard for us. And, and the biggest reason is that standards matter a lot when doing these kind of um, projects, efforts, I don't even know what to call this beast, um, but standards are really important. And there is a massive lack of standardization in the environment that we're working in. Just a few examples are there's an inconsistency and instability in the actual reporting that's done. So data is regularly changed retrospectively because of the locations decide to change the way they want to do reporting or they collect data or tests that they use. Um, and so this is a really big challenge as they go back and change their historic data. Um, there's also issues in terms of stability and just data structures. So we might even identify a source that we trust and that source changes the way they're presenting the data publicly over time. So even identifying a source for a particular location is not actually like a stable, reliable thing for us to do. And so this was a lot of the motivation behind building the anomaly detection system that we developed so that we could identify when these kind of changes were happening and correct for them before they propagated into the dashboard. So we really have to be nimble enough to be made aware of them and also react to them in real time. Um, there's also massive discrepancies in reported numbers among authoritative sources for overlapping jurisdictions. So this is an issue for everything at all spatial scales from counties in the US all the way up to countries. So for instance, in Texas, there's, there's discrepancies between what Texas says about certain counties in Texas and what those counties say about themselves. And that's because they make different decisions about how they include probable cases and, and things like that. And so um, we have to figure out how do we kind of build these composite data sets that capture 
all of these different authoritative reporting sources. And I could talk for a day on the challenges behind tracking data for the UK and France, who have changed their reporting, their reporting approach multiple times as well throughout this. Um, there's an issue of frequency and time of day reporting. This is a global pandemic. We're tracking it on a 24 seven basis. Um, you know, we want to provide these daily updates and we have to somewhere, you know, draw a chalk line and say, this is what happened on this day, which is impossible to do for a pandemic that's hitting everywhere in the world and reporting is being done, you know, on irregular um, intervals, sometimes not reliably at all. And so we found that making our daily snapshot at 400 GMT was the least bad, but it's not perfect and it still is problematic. Um, for, for some countries and we have to regularly address this. And then really critically, there's massive ambiguities in terms of the parameter definitions. This is everything from what is a probable case, what is a confirmed case. And this is partially because this is a new disease and there's new testing technologies coming about. And so um, there's a lot of variability in terms of how cases are actually quantified in different locations. Um, there's issues about what's reported, is it when the test was done? Is it when the public health authority received the test results or is it when they got made them public? Um, so these are just some examples. And for this, what we do is we just try to be as consistent as possible across locations and then report according to the latest CDC guidelines that are available. So moving forward, um, I can confidently say that we, we really never want to do what we're doing now again. We don't want to be building out this infrastructure to do data collection in real time while the pandemic is evolving. Um, it's really just not sustainable. I think we can do this, but it really it requires some really specific um, kind of innovation and, and sy new system development. And so I think on one hand, we really globally need a standardized reporting system. And this is standardization in terms of what is being reported, what are the variables, how are they defined, what is the structures that they need to be reported in. Um, and this should include things beyond just case data, obviously. This is all the contextual variables. This is related to testing data and, and other, other variables as well. Um, this obviously goes beyond COVID and this kind of system needs to be in place for emerging infectious diseases and notifiable diseases that are going to inevitably come up. The data needs to be made available at a spatial and temporal scale that's, that's actionable. So I don't need to know on a given week, there was five new cases in California, that's really not helpful. It needs to be at a fine spatial resolution and at least a daily, um, a daily temporal scale. And really critically, the data needs to be made public immediately upon release. So we can't have data that's provided and moved around internally among public health um, authorities, but not made public to research groups and just the general public. And this needs to also be provided in machine readable formats so that it's accessible to anyone that wants to use it. Uh, and so probably most importantly, this should be my first slide. I, I have to acknowledge that this is not my doing at all. Um, there is a wonderful team behind this and probably none of them have slept as much as they should in the last year. Um, so in Chang Dong is my PhD student that was really kind of the pioneer behind starting this in the first place with me. And then this is the team from the Sheridan Libraries, APL, uh, and then my center as well that have been really the core contributors to building out this, this dashboard and these data collection efforts from the start. Um, and then last, uh, I just want to acknowledge some of the funding and resource support that we've gotten as well. And this is both for the dashboard data collection efforts and then also the modeling that my group's doing um, with the data on top of that. So I think with that, I'm not sure exactly how we're doing on time, but I think I have time for a few questions. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for uh, first, such a wonderful contribution to science and the world and for a great presentation. Uh, let me begin uh, with a question from Anton. Um, he says, when vaccines become widely available, uh, it would be useful to track the percentage of people that have been vaccinated for various populations along with new cases of COVID-19. 
to show mm -hmm. the impact of vaccines on those populations. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I completely agree. We've been talking about that for months. It's it's absolutely something that I think is really important. It's on the list. And um, again, unfortunately, there isn't a set open data standard for how this reporting is going to be done, who's going to report it and where. So we kind of are just um, planning to kind of try and watch how that evolves and if we can manage it we'll, we'll do it but i have a lot of concerns about how that data is going to be made available and it's because it's not just about vaccination rates which is the first thing that's that's really important but there's going to be multiple different vaccines and they're going to have different levels of effectiveness and um and so there's a lot of kind of complications as well behind it that i think will be important to capture and i want to make sure that if we're going to do that that it's it's done correctly but it's, it's absolutely top of mind, so. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Andrea asked whether there are any ways for other PhD students with big data, uh, software engineering experience to help your group? Um, probably, send me an email. <laughs> there, it's, it's a big effort um, and we definitely have had people come in and help in different stages. Uh, and so if, if there's some specific interest, then def just reach out. Great. Let me see if there are any other questions. Uh, Charles, Lauren, uh, fantastic presentation. Thank you and the team so much. My question is, do you think the data structure you ended up designing in real time could have been done beforehand? Could it have been so effective? Um, I'm, so is that in terms of just the distinguishing nature of the variables we're reporting, or I'm not sure exactly what that question is referring to, but uh, it is really hard. It's definitely, I acknowledge that trying to plan ahead for something that doesn't exist now is tricky, but we do know a lot about at least basic variables that we know are gonna be important and relevant for these types of events when they happen. And I think that to the extent we can, the standards need to be designed around that. So at least new, you know, learning our lesson from what we've seen to date and making sure that standards are there to address those. And then inevitably new things will come up and new technologies and those will have to be incorporated. But I, I absolutely think there's lots of room for improvement in terms of being able to have said, these things need to be made available in this fashion um, on a regular basis up until now. And it would have been a much more rudimentary effort, effort if that existed to pull it all together into this centralized kind of location. Great. Another uh, question from my colleague Stuart Ray. Uh, have you learned any lessons about how to assess and orient people who come forward to help participate since I'm sure you found they varied considerably in longevity of their engagement. A project like this must have attracted people with a variety of motivations. Yeah, it is a really good question. And it's really been hard for me actually, because it's not in my nature to say no to people that want to collaborate. I usually am really excited and open and want to just involve people. And I've actually had to learn to be a bit guarded with this because there has been a lot of reach out um, all over the world that people that just want to contribute and we do have to be careful a lot of it too because it's actually you know we can't just be giving access to anyone that wants to contribute numbers to this dashboard to be able to control that um so it is it is pretty tricky i don't have a perfect answer for that so if anyone has suggestions on how to how to do that that would be great but so far we've had great experience internally at least at the university with, with people that have helped and, and jumped on board. There is a question from someone anonymous. I wonder uh, why the infrastructure around influenza tracking, assuming such infrastructure exists, could not be used for COVID as well. And I guess more broadly, how, how uh, is this shareable across different diseases? Yeah, it's a really good. So it's another thing that's top of mind for us is that I hope that all the work we've done this year doesn't go to waste when COVID's gone. Um, and I really do think that this infrastructure needs to and will exist moving forward. I actually think that it seems so obvious now to have it in place. And it's really, I don't think we'll like have a time in the future where there's ever one of these kind of new pandemics that come around where 
that data isn't just made available publicly in, in real time by somebody. Um, and it can be extended to flu, but also to these other diseases. The challenge is it, in some ways, the architecture and infrastructure we built is definitely transferable in terms of how the data is processed and, and moved through the pipeline. But like I said, we actually had to go out and custom uh, and find and custom build hundreds of scrapers to pull this data in and format it and process it so that it would be compatible for this open data product we're trying to generate. And those, because there are not open data standards on who's providing that data and how they're providing it, that effort would have to be completely kind of regenerated for a new virus if it were to emerge. And so that's really the reason that I think we need to make sure that there are these standards in place so that when there's a new one, you pull the data from the same place. And so you don't have to go out searching because like I said, there's 3,500 locations. Like it's, it's not an easy task to recreate even for, for that piece of it. Wonderful. Well, so I apologize to the many other uh, people who were asking questions in the chat. I'll pass them to Lauren, but thank you so much, Lauren. It's been absolutely a fantastic talk. Thank you for your service to the community and the world. And thank you for a great presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, enjoy the rest of the, the sessions. Thanks. Thanks. Hello. Yes. So I would, the next speaker is Mark Stein, and uh, I would like to. So this is one of the collaborations I mentioned in my introductory talks. That's in collaboration with Ideas, and he was also one of the seed funds uh, recipients last year. So I'd like to hand over to Mark. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can, can you see that? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So thank you. I appreciate the opportunity um, both to, to do this project with the C grant um, and also to talk to you about it. Um, so I wanted to start um, by thanking uh, my two great colleagues, um, Julia Burdick Will and Gerard Lemson, uh, who are helping do this project. Um, and, and really, I wanted to, to ground uh, what I'm going to talk about in, in our work uh, that we've been doing over the last five years um, and kind of get to the, to the, the, the data needs uh, to investigate such questions. So um, I am uh, an associate professor in the School of Education at Hopkins. I'm also the interim executive director of the Baltimore Education Research Consortium. Um, we are a research practice partnership with Hopkins, Morgan State, <clears throat> and City Schools, uh, Baltimore City Public Schools. And um, we do research that combines uh, rigorous uh, cutting edge research with uh, the needs of our practice partners uh, in city schools. And so this line of work uh, really started uh, on my way to the office one morning, uh, listening to NPR. Um, as most mornings start. And uh, the one on the left here was this fabulous piece of journalism that uh, the journalist followed a young lady to school um, because Baltimore City, like most urban districts or a lot of urban districts, do not have yellow bus service, which in the United States, uh, you would often see yellow buses taking kids to their zone schools. Uh, in Baltimore City, that's not the case. Um, kids who live more than a mile and a half away from school are given uh, transit passes to ride the, the MTA here in Baltimore. And, you know, that can, as you can imagine, trying to navigate a city 
uh, for, for children and youth to get to school. Um, this uh, journalist just just followed along and, and heard the difficulty that this young lady had in getting across town. And given my work uh, working with the school district, as well as thinking about education policy, um, coupled with an acknowledgement that city schools, uh, like a lot of urban American districts, um, have, have real problems with student attendance. Um, we, in education, we talk about chronic absenteeism, which in the state of Maryland is 10% of enrolled days. So in a 180 day year, uh, children missing more than 18 days of school, which is about three weeks of instruction. Uh, in Baltimore City, depending on the level, uh, in high schools, it's about 40% of children uh, meet that standard to be considered chronically absent. Uh, a significant portion of our children miss greater than, than 30, 40 days of school a year. So, it, you know, and there's, and there's lots of things involved in that. And after hearing the story about uh, having to use transit to get to school and how difficult it was, uh, got me thinking about, well, how are this transit system that's completely outside of the educational system, how is it related to uh, our observation of children not being in school and all of the other effects that come with, uh, you know, in the simplest sense, uh, not being at school is related to not having the opportunity to benefit from the instruction that goes on there. So long story short, uh, we started down a road of how can we investigate this? Um, I knew nothing about transportation at the time, um, but have since grown to appreciate its far reaching impacts, not just for school children, uh, but for citizens in our city and cities around the world. Uh, this is a picture, it's a, it's a grounding picture for me on this work of, uh, again, on the way to the office, it was raining that day. Uh, these are school children. Uh, thankfully, they have a, a covered bus stop, but most bus stops are not covered. Um, and they're on their way to school. Um, and so uh, we started investigating um, what we can call transit difficulty. Um, so it's not just the total length of time that it might take a child to get to school, but also the number of transfers. Um, because when you have to transfer buses, you're, you're left up to the vagaries of, of whether that bus is on time, whether you're going to be able to make that transfer, and ultimately the extent to which you'll be able to get to school. Um, so we be, we've done a series of projects using static um, GTFS data, which is scheduled data for transit. Um, and we looked at some, some basic ideas. Um, what is the extent that transit difficulty is related to absenteeism? Um, where we've found uh, there to be the more difficult the route is, so the more transfers, the more um, absences a child accrues over the year. Um, we've also looked at uh, exposure to violence because our, our children and youth uh, are being asked to, to transit a city with all that entails. Um, so on the left, you can see uh, a heat map of um, violent crimes uh, over the course of an academic year, um, I think. And then the, the kind of uh, white circles are uh, transit stops and the volume of kids that we would estimate to go through those stops. Um, so you can see um, crime is, it, while it's definitely in the center of the city, it's also spread out uh, across the city. And we can see kids transiting through these spaces that, that have violent crimes in them throughout the year. So the the working theory here is that you know, uh, exposure to, to violent crime through these spaces uh, may have some effects on whether kids choose to go to school, uh, whether they avoid those spaces. Um, and in this paper, you can see on, on the right, um, while crime is generally spread across the city, it's also very uh, localized. So this is uh, the Harlem Park neighborhood. And we're plotting the, the dark lines are showing block faces that have uh, had violent crimes during the year. And you can see that not all block faces experience uh, violent crime during the year and some experience quite a bit more uh, the, and the circles are transit stops. So you can imagine a kid living in this neighborhood having to, to hit a bus stop, uh, maybe making decisions or choices of whether to go or to, to change which stop they're going to. Um, there's also a, a practical application of being able to estimate routes. So I probably should have said we've um, been able to estimate transit routes for kids from their uh, residential location uh, to the school of enrollment. This is an example of some work we've done in Philadelphia. 
So creating maps that are potentially useful for kids and when they're considering school choice, which school do I want to go to, where do I live? These are transit sheds that kind of map out uh, expected time of travel to get from any location in the city to the school. Um, and you can see, I think one of the key points here is, you know, obviously being close to transit, uh, it reduces times, as you can see with uh, the two subway lines in Philadelphia, but also that different schools have different transit sheds. And that is likely to condition quite a bit uh, absenteeism and also enrollments. Um, similarly, we can start to drill down in on the, on the left. We're just plotting out densities of travel time of actually enrolled kids. Um, and you can see the, the top school there uh, is a, what's considered a neighborhood school in Philadelphia. So a lot of kids walking and the, the most kids walking, but there are still kids in these types of schools that are traveling quite long distances um, versus the school at the bottom where the vast majority of kids are traveling over an hour to get to that school. And to put that in context, in Baltimore City, we've estimated the, the median travel time to be 36 minutes uh, for kids. And in Philadelphia, it's 28. Um, I think that's part of the system um, itself. Uh, you know, the extent of the network, uh, rail travel also decreases that amount of time. On the right, um, we're plotting um, general locations. It's not the exact location of individual kids. Um, I think this highlights in uh, urban school districts that have some form of school choice where kids are choosing their high schools, let's say. Um, the green spaces are kids that are, are probably walking uh, to school. And you can see there's, there's green throughout the map, but there's also these higher travel times uh, as we move towards the red dots um, that are dispersed throughout the city. So one of the things that I like to say about Baltimore, and it's also relevant in Philadelphia, is that you know we have kids going from everywhere to everywhere and then the extent that they are exposed uh, to different spaces and places throughout the city and different um, elements in those cities condition what we observe and not just attendance but likely also their um, ability to derive benefit out of schooling um, so that brings us to to where we are now um, up to this point we've been using largely static schedules um, which have been very useful uh, in investigating these things, but the, the time scale of transit and attendance is at a daily level. Um, so what I'm displaying here at the top, uh, proportion of students arriving on time, you can see there is variation uh, across the year in this metric. So this is an entire school year. Um, down at the bottom, part of a pilot project we did several years ago, looking at actual student transit swipes. Um, there's quite a bit of variation in absenteeism, so students that weren't showing up during the day. Um, so the, the absenteeism is a daily process, right? That's both the individual um, choosing or wanting to go to school. It's also all the other things that are happening in context for that child. And so we really want to push down into this daily um, space. Also, transit itself is, is daily, and it's even uh, minute by minute. Um, as buses uh, move through the city, they are delayed or they speed up. Uh, more people at stops cause buses to slow down. And so there's really, while there's a published schedule, you can go to Google and, and get a, a, a transit estimate. You want to go from point A to B. But the reality is um, the bus is likely to be delayed. It may be full. It may, for our kids, uh, there's lots of anecdotal evidence from their own experiences that buses commonly pass them by and this can uh, compound into lateness. So we really wanted to dig into this to the appropriate uh, temporal scale here. Um, and that's this project. So uh, leveraging, we, we did some testing of this kind of in the back room of the office and we just didn't have enough um, com computational ability to, to do it at the scale we, we believe it needs to be done. Um, so we are uh, partnering uh, with Gerard and his team and SciServer um, and building out the capacity to um, scrape the real-time transit feeds. Uh, we are currently doing it every seven seconds. So a bus has a transponder, it pings its location uh, back uh, to the MTA, and then we're able to pull a, a real-time feed off of that. 
And then we're archiving it with the hope to um, build out a daily transit schedule that reflects what actually happened versus the sometimes fictitious schedule of, of transit, such that we can then um, interleave that with daily attendance data to really get a sense of the uh, variability, not just in transit, but how it potentially impacts the variability in daily attendance. Um, this is uh, a, a simple example of some of the data that comes out of it. This is a, a one bus. The, the red line is the planned uh, stop times of, of the bus over its route. And you can see there's, there's quite a bit of variability day over day. Um, you know, there's also some noise and errors in the transponders themselves. Um, but this is the kind of variation that we think it is at the level that, that really matters for kids. Um, and really the size server platform is, is uh, perfect for us to be able to do this at the scale of every seven seconds, 24 hours a day. Um, and hopefully not just Baltimore, but we can scale it up to other cities. Um, and then this is just a, a, a real crude example of leveraging the, the Jupyter notebooks within size server to, um, we're also putting the routing engine inside of size server so we can then query directly both the, the GTFS schedule data together with the routing engine and then do daily routing for, for spaces across the city. Um, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, I don't think it would have been possible without the power of Sci Server. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing um, the results for Baltimore, but it's also uh, an opportunity to get it to scale to a much, to basically any city that has transit and school choice. So thank you. Yes, so questions. So uh, on the chat, I didn't see any questions yet. So please type in your questions in the Q&A form. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then let me introduce the breakout session. Thanks, thanks Mark again. So we are going to start a breakout session and it will be Harold Lamson talking about the site server. So I think the chat room just received the link to the breakout Zoom. So please click on that and we will start, continue with the main conference at 10.55. So please disconnect this session and click on the Zoom room, please. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so see you at the main room at 10.55.